So today we're going to be talking a little bit about how to leverage your business's overall cybersecurity posture as a business differentiator. So on the agenda, we've got a few items we're going to cover, right? Uh, first of all, we'll, we'll kind of give you a little background, just who we are, right? We're speaking uh, with, with you today, kind of figure we'd give you a little backdrop on a little bit about Compass and, and it can share some credibility there, hopefully. Uh, the objective of this webinar, we're going to cover the key points there and you'll see throughout this presentation that uh, we hit all those points and then some. Uh, what is cybersecurity? What is compliance? And then the role of security, you know, cybersecurity within a business. And then we'll take that into kind of improving your security posture overall. And then we'll address uh, some of the cyber uh, threat landscape that uh, we're all subject to, like it or not. And, uh, and then we'll talk about how to how to sell your cybersecurity posture, so to speak. And then we'll bring it all home with kind of a sort of a summary, if you will, of the uh, you know of the whole uh, presentation. So. Yep. So a little bit about Compass IT Compliance. Um, we were founded in 2010 by Bill De Palma and Jerry Hughes, who we have here on the call. Um, we're one of the nationwide leaders in providing IT security, compliance, and risk management services um, to all different types of companies of all sizes in all industries, as you can see. All right. So a couple of uh, just worth mentioning affiliates of ours. So we've got a, a better known business, Compass CyberGuard. And, and for a lot of the folks on the call, we've done work with your organizations and performing you know, ethical hacking and vulnerability scans and things of that nature, just expanding those capabilities with the uh, veteran ownership um, that we, uh, status that we've, uh, uh, we've added to that. And then uh, lastly, the Compass Assurance team uh, providing SOC 2, SOC 1, 2, and 3 audits, right? Type 1s and Type 2s. So that's uh, kind of uh, one of the newer uh, businesses that we've been uh, we're rolling out over the last couple of years and finally got it up and running. So we're excited about that as well. And, uh, yeah. you know, we've got a number of different services uh, under the umbrella of all those. So if you have questions along the way today, because some of the things we're going to cover, that's why we put this here, was really more just to give you a sense for come up some of the things we do. But a lot of you may have your own uh, solutions and that's fine. But just let you know that these are some of the ones that we provide uh, to our clients uh, you know, by way of uh, whether it's compliance, security, or vulnerability management, things of that nature. Um, so just wanted to include that. And uh, and then I keep moving my cursor there. There we go. All right. So today our, our main objective is essentially defining what is cybersecurity and compliance, how to um, define and improve on your overall posture within your organization, um, talk a little bit about some of the penalties, whether it's financial or reputational, um, that can come from not having a strong and robust cybersecurity posture, um, and some of the means that you can use to remediate those issues um, within your business. All right, and then the other thing too is some of this, as you go through, you know, there's a lot, a lot here in the uh, in the intro here, but you know, it, 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 it's not all bad news, right? Some of this uh, that we will share today, you'll see that while there are regulations governing different industries and different aspects of of your business. Um, there, are, uh, there are positive aspects from it as well. So we're going to show you how some of these things can be actually perceived uh, and, and, and be introduced as positive to your client base uh, and the customers that you serve. That's a little bit about why is cybersecurity. Um, cybersecurity is it's a, it's a huge factor in, in any business, any industry uh, within the United States and across the globe, obviously. Um, in the past, a lot of companies thought of it as almost an afterthought. Um, today, that really isn't an option. It's, it's, you must have cybersecurity built into the foundation um, of your business, and, and it's a continuous process. It's not a one-and-done thing. Um, you can't just do it once and forget about it. You have to continuously be improving um, on your position uh, with your cybersecurity. Yeah, I'm, a lot, I'm a lot older than Jake. You probably, you probably can tell that from the first uh, intro. But honestly, you know, in the old days, it was... It was sort of added later, right? So when it came to the financial industry, where you know, sure, sure, we had controls, of course, but but as we were being examined by the federal examiners, you know, over the years, you could see that being ramped up more and more, uh, putting more, uh, you know, requiring more controls and more ongoing testing. As Jake mentioned, it's not a uh, it's not a one and done. While we do a lot of uh, point in time audits and, and security assessments, it is a, it's an ongoing uh, process. It's a cyclic process, right? So as new threats come about. Uh, you, you need as a business to understand them, to educate your staff on them, and kind of move through to mitigate the risks until the next, uh, you know, until the next challenge comes about. Yep. Um, so here are just some uh, kind of broad examples of, you know, quote unquote, what is cybersecurity? These are more controls and kind of 
thought processes on how you can work on the cybersecurity posture within the organization. Um, so asset management, obviously, all about you know hardware, software, um, the management of those assets uh, throughout their life cycle. Yeah, and if you look at data classification, I mean, all these actually, like Jake said, there's there there are actually some of these, and, and if not more, be sort of programs, if you will. The program being defined as certainly a policy that governs it to to sort of set the foundation, but a series of procedures potentially to roll up to those policies which need to align with the laws in your in your particular industry but also uh the monitoring is part of this program for all of these particular disciplines mm -hmm. and and then uh you know education uh to the staff right so it's a kind of an ongoing process and if i take the next one data classification for example you know these these are are key areas that are often overlooked in organizations as as jake and i and our team here at compass goes into the field for uh, you know, to, to perform an audit or a risk assessment uh, of an environment, um, often we see great policies, but unfortunately, these policies aren't always implemented. Meaning they read well, but they're actually not. Uh, the staff is doesn't even understand them, or they don't uh, know how to really implement them. In the case of classification, uh, you know, where we, we always say there's sort of two worlds there, right? Is the physical, uh, which is the facilities and or the third party providers that you do business with, those facilities. And then there's a logical world, which is a sort of network diagrams, if you will, you know, subnets within that. And, and, and I always say, if you can take these two environments and take your data classification policy and, and map it to these environments. So, so take the first one, the physical layout of a facility. I'm gonna look at your policies and, and in your data classification policy, there's typically four levels. Some organizations only have three. The first level, lowest level is it's marketing. So marketing information, boy, you want that everywhere. You want it on your website. You want to hand it out like candy. So that one it, it is, is intended to be to the public and, and all over the place. And the next level is internal. So it may be correspondence. Maybe I'm sending Jake uh, a, an email about the, today's presentation. That's internal. It wasn't intended for the outside world. Not the end of the world. No big security threat if somebody intercepted that. Uh, you know, But but it, it was internal. It was intended for, for just communications between one or more parties inside. Then, then we move to the third level, and that's the big one. That's that's the uh, confidential uh, band, if you will, and that's where you know, information like personally identifiable information, PII, you hear that all the time, and that means things like social security number, maybe your credit card number, banking information, all the stuff that you legally cannot obtain uh, on the internet or through other sources. That that's confidential. And then the fourth level, our high, highest tier is is restricted, and that's kind of like. You know, it, it's even within the organization itself, it's, it's even the smallest group of, of in the know. That is to say, for example, uh, the C-level or maybe even just the, uh, the, the CEO and the board have knowledge. It's stuff like, you know, maybe we're acquiring another business or we're, we're removing another, you know, part of the business and things like that. Those are big uh, pieces of information that if you're publicly traded for sure could, could sway the market, could have influence on that. So, so those are, that's restricted kind of gives you an example. So those are the four levels and you just kind of take those through room by room in the mapping of your facility and, and, and classify to the most conservative level. That means if I've got a, a room that has mostly nothing in it, it's all public, but yet we've got one area where there's a filing cabinet with you know HR records and, and it's got confidential information, the whole room is confidential. And just so do it at a very easy level like that. And likewise, in a similar manner, on your network diagram, when you're mapping it out, you're doing the same thing. This subnet may be completely public, but then there's one server that's in that same subnet and it's confidential. Well, then the whole subnet is considered confidential. That's kind of a quick way of, uh, of thinking about it. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, and then moving on to the secure configurations, a lot of people probably refer to that as a baseline configuration. That's a pretty general term. Um, and it's essentially a documented baseline um, it can be a checklist, it can be a procedure, um, and, and typically it's governed by a policy on how each type of system um, or device within the organization is going to be configured from, from the ground up, from the time it's purchased um, and, and sent to the facility or wherever it's being deployed from. It needs to be built to those minimum security um, standards that you and your organization have defined um, over the years. More and more today we see in the field, um, more common with workstations or older servers um, where there was no original baseline configuration, you know, a network administrator 10 years ago put it together and it's just been built on over time. Um, and we find a lot of gaps in uh, security controls in those types of environments. Uh, so having that documented baseline that's regularly reviewed 
um, approved by management or the C-suite, um, depending on the, uh, the configuration of the organization itself, um, and then deployed um, along with a solid change management program um, is also key to keeping those configurations secure um, and keeping up with the evolving landscape of business and cybersecurity. Thanks, Jake. So uh, the next one, risk and vulnerability management. Again, a program, right? Starts with a policy, some procedures, but at the end of the day, it is an ongoing uh, process that, that is continuously changing as your business changes. Uh, I think you would all agree with the organizations you're at now and the ones you were previously at. Any business needs to change with the times, whether it's new business opportunities or delivery channels that come out. These are exciting new opportunities and folks jump right to getting them to market, which sounds great from a business perspective. We just need to sort of take a step back and maybe risk assess first and identify any control weaknesses within the system or systems that we're looking to deploy, put appropriate controls around, monitor those ongoing, and now we can safely go to market with those. And the vulnerability management aspect as well, too, implies lots of things, not just the vulnerabilities that may be identified uh, through a risk assessment, but we also you know, perform a number of internal and external vulnerability and, and penetration tests for clients of ours in their environment. So as you go through all of these assessments and, and monitoring, if you will, they, they yield potentially control weaknesses. And so you need to kind of capture those in a concise format, identify what the risk level is of each of these control weaknesses, uh, move to implement controls to mitigate those risks to reasonable levels. So sort of putting it on in one place, we recommend what's called a risk register. And it's a place where you can kind of capture uh, uh, all of the control weaknesses that you have in whether it was an audit or risk assessment that was performed internally or even by an outside independent party. Take those risks, identify them, assign ownerships to those, basically a small project plan, dates of completion, and how they will be mitigated one by one. And as you mitigate those, you move them off the list and new ones come on as, uh, as new audits and assessments and scans and things of that nature are performed. But if you think about it from a business perspective, you got one place to look at, one place to manage all your risks and challenges. You've got ownership, you've got dates, you know what the plan is. And when you're audited, I'll tell you what, auditors, uh, whether it's Compass working uh, with you and, and, and performing an audit of your environment or an in independent uh, party, uh, you'll be prepared. And that's a great tool of yours to say, hey, look, we've got a great risk and vulnerability management program. And it starts with our policies and procedures, but here's our, our, our risk register that we track all the risks that were identified. We assign ownership. They will love it. Your manager will love it. it it's a great way of controlling uh, you know, the, the risks as they come on and, and out of your environment. Yeah, great points, Jerry. And going moving on to the last bullet here, um, this is kind of a catch-all. There are so many aspects of cybersecurity. Um, some of the, the, the ones that we listed here, logging, access control, backups. Um, these are kind of the givens. If you talk to any competent IT or security professional, um, these are the items that they know are crucial um, to a robust cybersecurity posture. Um, you know, logging all access and actions that are taking on systems, um, controlling who can access which systems, and then in turn, which um, data that they can access, going back to what Jerry was uh, discussing with the data classification and protection. Um, these all tie back um, to those high level points. Um, backing up your data and your systems in the case of an incident or a disaster, uh, you have to be able to bounce back. Um, and the controls and, and the topics they, they never end. There's so many different controls, depending on what framework um, you're, you're, you're measuring against, what type of business um, you're providing to your clients, um, and what industry you're in. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jake. And a couple other things, too, with this. I mean, there's a lot in that one last bullet. You know, everything from logging. And, and, and these aren't just suggestions. These are, in most industries, and, and, and whether it's a framework that you're, you're managing your business to, or a law or regulation, which... You know, most, if not all of us are governed by, by different laws and regulations. You know, the requirements for logging systems, centralized logging is, for example, a PCI requirement for that standard, but also it's a requirement for privacy laws governing uh, the information that you use and share on, on the customers of yours, you know, in, ensuring that you've got log files. These are detective controls that used in the event of a compromise. They're going to go right to your log files or your, your team should interrogate those log files see what happened, when and where, where the access was gained, you know, things like that. And on all of these, as you move across from left to right, the access controls and things, these are uh, critical facets of even, you know, personally too, you, you, all, you all have these kinds of things going on in your personal life too, you, you know, ensuring that your controls are, your access controls are, are properly governed, you're using strong passwords, 
things like that, and backing up systems, constantly monitoring. This is it, it's it keeps us busy for sure. And and you um, and your businesses need to have an eye on these things for sure to help you kind of uh, see tomorrow uh, past a lot of the threats we're up against. Great point. Yeah. So moving on, what is compliance? Um, and this is something I should have mentioned uh, probably a slide or two ago. I like to think of security, if you think about it, um, in the sense of your home. Um, you want to build a fence around your property to protect your home um, from intruders, from the bad actors, from anyone getting into your property that shouldn't be there. That is the security aspect. Compliance is ensuring that that fence was built up to code. Um, that's a good way that I like to think about it. If you want to keep people out, you're not going to build a three-foot chain link fence. You're going to build a six-foot stockade fence, maybe with some barbed wire over the top, um, and that adheres to the codes. Um, or at least the standards of what you're trying to protect. Um, yeah, no, that's that's excellent, Jake. Yeah, we, we are, as I said, we, we, with Compass and some of the, you know, if you remember the previous slides, we're, we're the compliance officer, we're the virtual compliance officer for a number of organizations. And we're doing that, right? We're making sure that fence is, is properly installed and meets, it meets the specs that it has to adhere to. And like I said before, we're all governed by different laws, regs. And one other important note, our own policies as well. So for example, it's kind of a, it's, a, it's interesting to, to, to some folks when, when I mention this, but you know, your policies are almost as strong as, um, you know, uh, as, as the regulations that govern you. What I mean by that is sure they need to align with the law, but your, your policies can even be more conservative. And if I'm auditing you and your policy, for example, for record retention, say the law said you have to maintain it for three years, but you, in your policy say, hey, we're gonna maintain this record type for five years. We come in and audit you and you only have three years worth and you point to the laws, hey, I was only required by three years. No, your, your policy said, and your management or board of directors that have endorsed those policies and made them sort of your Bible, you, you are held to those and bound to those. And that's a control weakness, that's a finding because it, well, what else are you not following if you're not following that facet of your policy? So, so really treat those policies and they are, like I said before, the foundation of any uh, security program uh, anywhere because it's the do's and don'ts. And, and one other very, very important note about policies, there's, you know, um, I, I see so many audits, so many that, uh, you know, my head spins be because sometimes they just kind of, they're a bunch of thoughts. They'll, you know, it would say something, for example, well, we're going to perform uh, regular vulnerability scans on our network. Now, that may sound good to uh, um, an IE person, but who's we? You know, who do I hold accountable if it wasn't done, who do I, who do, what title? I need a title. So the security officer or whatever, the IT director of IT will perform regular scans. Well, that's close. That, that's halfway there. I know who to hold accountable, but regular? Regular for me might be monthly. Jake might want it done weekly. So, so it needs to be something like the control statement should be a clearly defined role and a clearly defined responsibility. For example, the director of IT will perform quarterly vulnerability scans on all external IP addresses. Perfect. Now I know who's doing what and I can hold them 100% accountable. Very, very important. In every one of your policies, those policy statements need to be clear and concise. Hey, great point, Jerry. Um, so here is um, here are some basic examples um, or some of the most well-known, I would say, examples of some compliance frameworks, regulations, um, and, and laws that different companies um, have to abide by. Um, I would say that HIPAA and GDPR are probably the most common known terms um, outside of the industry, you hear about them in the news all the time, um, very common terms. Uh, GDPR is one of the big ones that's uh, really made its way into the US. Um, it protects the personal data and privacy for people, individuals or customers within the European Union. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of companies that are based in America or in other countries outside of the EU um, for a long time were under the false belief or false impression um, that they were not subject to the GDPR rules and regulations. Um, but that's not true. If you have even as little as one customer within any of the European Union um, area, you have to abide by the GDPR um, regulations and rules. Yeah, and thanks, Jake. And as you mentioned too, like these are just a small example of the types of whether it's a, a law, regulation, or standard. Um, these uh, the, the the GDPR one is a good example of one. Every state in the United States, all fifty states have um, uh, provisions for state privacy. Uh, and and they're, they're similar as well to GDPR in the sense that they protect the consumer where they live. For example, Compass's home office is here in North Providence, Rhode Island. However, we're in every state. We're in about 20 some odd countries uh, performing work. Well, we, we, the laws protect the consumer where they live, not where my business is. So if I'm working with clients in, in California, I'm governed by the CCPA 1 and 2. Those, those are very rigid 
uh, stringent state privacy laws protecting those consumers. And so it, it, that's how it works. It's where the consumer lives, not where the business is. Um, so, so that's um, an interesting point. Yeah, um, good, great points, Jerry. And then so for the ISO 27001 and 2, it's another framework. Um, and, and it's essentially the requirements for establishing, implementing, and improving um, on this information security management system. Um, so many times companies will start with kind of um, the baseline. They'll go through an initial assessment, um, see what the findings were from the assessors or from the auditors. So a lot of times, you know, as an auditor at Compass, we'll come into an organization, um, we'll meet with, um, you know, different department owners, data owners, um, we'll interview uh, different subject matter experts across different teams, whether that's HR, finance, IT, information security, um, and kind of get an understanding of where they are. So that's all about establishing it. Um, if, if they don't have anything implemented yet at all, sometimes uh, Compass will come in and we can give um, kind of that, uh, that advice on how to implement um, the program to then improve upon your existing security management system um, and program as well. And the next one, thanks, the next one, SOC 2, I'll tell you what, so SOC work, as I mentioned earlier, with the Compass Assurance Team, we perform a lot of SOC audits for uh, organizations, service providers, if you will. So these service providers or business associates in, in the uh, terminology of the healthcare industry, these service providers are providing, you know, outsourced services from in, in for organizations. We use different service providers. Most businesses do. It makes great business sense to but, but these audits, these SOC audits, uh, and particularly SOC 2, uh, type 1, which is the design of the controls, and type 2, which is taking that design and testing the operating effectiveness over a period of time, those audits are, are meant and intended to provide assurance to companies that want to use these third-party providers, that want to outsource certain functions so that they can rely on an organization uh, you know, to, to make sure that their controls are in place that the customer information that they are entrusted with and now that they're entrusting another party with is, is going to be protected appropriately. So a lot of weight on SOC 2 type 2 audits. Uh, can't stress that enough. And, and you're going to probably see those a lot in your in your world uh, as well. Yeah. Um, and so the next two here, HIPAA and PCI, two, two huge ones within the industry. Um, HIPAA, most people have probably heard of, it protects your, your health information, essentially, your sensitive patient data, uh, the data that essentially only you, your doctor, and maybe some nurses or um, other staff within your healthcare office should be able to access. Um, and, it, and it also dictates who can access it, how often it can be accessed, how long it should be stored for, um, and then your right to have that information moved or removed or modified um, as you live throughout your life. Um, so that's obviously crucial to everyone's day-to-day -day life. Your health information is something near and dear to everyone's heart within the public um, and within companies as well. Um, PCI is another huge one. We've all had, you know, gotten that call or that text that our credit card or debit card has been hacked, the information has been breached, um, and there's been a, a fraudulent purchase made on one of your cards. Nobody likes to get those calls, so that's where PCI comes in. Um, the PCI framework and the PCI DSS, they've developed over the course of uh, 10 plus years, probably closer to 20 years now, um, a set of uh, requirements that, that govern and safeguard how companies that process, store, or handle um, your credit card data and information um, must, must essentially protect that information. And thanks. And, and you know what's funny about that one? That's a, it's a standard. It is not a law. It is not a regulation. It's not a guideline. It's a standard, meaning uh, the, it came from the five primary brands, MasterCard, Visa, American Express, Discover, and JDD, uh, JCD. The, these, these, formed, these card brands formed a, a, a sort of a group, if you will, Called the Data um, Security uh, Council, and, and these folks have come up with this standard, and it, it's evolved over time. And as, as a qualified security assessor myself, and our company performs as a qualified security assessor company, we perform these audits all over the world. And these things are, are very intense and intended to protect the cardholder data for the consumer. Now, while it's not a law, it's as swift in terms of penalties as if it was a law. For example, the the brands can uh, you know. You're governed by your, your your acquiring bank, and that is to say, as a merchant's performing, you know, credit card transactions. If they're not following the data security standard, they actually can be penalized and uh, by the acquiring bank directly, uh, month after month, until such time that they are compliant to the point where they can actually say that's it. The brand can say you're you're done and step in and basically say you're not going to be using our brand anymore. You can no longer process credit card transactions. You think about that for most businesses. Think about a business. It's hard to find if any business that doesn't accept credit cards or, 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 or um, debit cards as a form of payment. 
So, so it really is as powerful and swift as any other law uh, on this page. Yep. Um, and moving on to the last bullet here, CMMC um, is one of uh, probably the newer ones in the industry. It comes down from the Department of Defense. Um, and it's essentially, it's still in, in the works. It's still in progress. It's not fully enforced yet. Um, I believe by early 2025 is the next goal for when they want to kind of put it out for public release and start actually enforcing it. Um, and it essentially protects sensitive unclassified information, FCI, CUI, um, that is shared by the Department of Defense with any of its contractors or subcontractors. Um, so that type of information could be blueprints, it could be contracts, it could be uh, drawings, it could be communication between government personnel and, and contractors. Um, and similar to all the, the previous uh, regulations and frameworks that we've just discussed, it's a, it's a set of standards um, and rules on how these companies, contractors, and some contractors must protect um, and deal with that information. Yeah, and the funny thing is that you mentioned government, so that's where I can explain the following. It's fully not obvious. It had been sort of a series of stops and starts. We performed a number of assessments uh, for CMC, and we continue to do so, but, but they're still going through in the uh, official rollout, and, and there's different levels of assessment. We are on that path and have done it for, for organizations. So when the government finally gets it going completely, uh, we'll be able to assist clients more in that arena. Yeah, good point. So a little bit about the differences between cybersecurity and compliance. Um, I hope we've done a pretty good job of explaining what each was. Each one is on its own and they do go hand in hand. Um, but going back to the fence analogy, um, cybersecurity and compliance, they go hand in hand, but they're two separate, completely separate things. Um, you may be compliant to, to one specific framework that doesn't 100% of the time mean that you are going to be secure. Um, and the same in reverse. You may believe or you may know as an organization that that your systems and your information are secure, but that doesn't mean that it matches up with the guidelines, the rules, the regulations um, of the different compliance standards uh, that we work with and that your companies may, um, may be subject to. Yeah, I know what's funny too about that using your analogy, Jake, with the, uh, the fence. So say we've got a nice compliant fence, we've built it perfectly to the specs, everything looks great. We didn't lock the gate, people can enter. So our security was lacking in that example. So there's a big difference. So we always, we always like to say when we go into organizations, you know, a lot of folks are just like, hey, listen, I just wanna, I just wanna make sure we're compliant. And, and that's, I guess that's important. I know that because there are penalties that can be levied against your organization for non-compliance. But, but, but if I had a choice between compliance and security, I'm leaning more on the security side. So if, if it's done properly, right? If you're doing security the right way, you're protecting, you're putting controls in place, and monitoring those controls to protect the sensitive information of the customers that you're entrusted to serve. And, and with that said, you do that right, and that's what really matters. And, and you will find that you are very compliant with the laws and regs in that area if you do it thoroughly. Yeah, great point. And, and just to touch back uh, where it says on the second bullet there about compliance, um, a lot of times it's considered a security baseline. So a lot of the frameworks or laws, they uh, a very easy example to understand is a 12 character minimum password. That, that may make you compliant, but is that the most secure that you could be? We see a lot of organizations that we go into, they adhere to say the, the PCI framework they must in order to process credit cards. That demands a 12 character password. If you have a 14 or 16 character password minimum plus multi-factor, plus any of the other factors that can be thrown in there, you're gonna be even more secure than the compliant baseline. So, you know, you gotta, this is a good key point of this presentation. We're about halfway done. And the reason why I mentioned it as being key, up to this point, a lot of information relative to security, compliance, some of the stuff that you need to do to, to protect your environment. You know, these are all the, I don't say negative, but the you know, hard stuff, the, the difficult things that you're constantly, you know, uh, need, required to budget for and implement appropriately. And, and then we throw in the mix that, oh, by the way, the market's changing, your business is changing, and, and the landscape is changing, the, the threat landscape. So, so now it's, it's not just a point in time, it, it's... It's an ongoing process, so so don't put a one and done process or solution in place. Uh, you know, put in put in a procedure or process that's that can change with time. And as you implement new, uh, you know, new uh, delivery channels for your business or new, uh, you know, uh, business uh, opportunities, um, you know, you've got a better framework to do so in a sound and secure way. So moving forward on these slides, now we're going to take all that information that Jake and I sort of have provided uh, to you, uh, you know, and, and now tell you how we can use it in a great, great way to, to you know, foster and, and bolster your business and build it uh, moving forward. Yep. So, so, so being secure and being compliant um, these days is a, is a great way to build trust and reputation uh, with existing customers or clients and potentially new um, customers and compliance. 
every single day now, or probably multiple times a day. You, you can see it on the news, on TV, on the radio, um, on any RSS feeds, anywhere you get your news, your news. There are constant attacks, hacks, breaches, um, of all types of information. Just a week or so ago, the Social Security Administration um, just disclosed a breach of however many records of everyone on this call is probably Social Security number and other um, uh, PII and uh, personally identifiable information. Obviously, we have no choice. We have to essentially, quote unquote, do business with the Social Security Administration. But if you're looking at two different companies to do potential business with, they offer the exact same services, the exact same cost and value, um, everything that you're looking for, but one's secure and can prove that with their compliance um, documentation, and one's not secure and not compliant. Who are you going to choose? Yeah, and good, another good point too on this slide, you know, you look at some of the stuff which is relative to building trust and reputations. You know, reputation can be good or bad, and, and you wanna make sure that yours, you know, yours is solid. Uh, for the reasons that Jay just mentioned, you know, if I'm, I'm competing with other businesses, I want to make sure we've got a great reputation, not only quality deliverables and things of that nature, but that we've got the certifications, whether it's, for example, if I'm uh, having, um, I'm serving certain industries as a service provider, an MSP, I want to have that SOC 2 type to you all day long. That's going to be that independent audit of my organization. It's all about scope, but about the scope of the business that I'm, I'm selling these services for, I want them to have them audit the heck out of it. So not only do I put my head down on my pillow and know that my business is safe and sound, but now I'm also going to be able to take that perceived negative that, oh, I've got to have this audit done. I've got to pay that money. Yeah, but it's a way of showing how good you are, right? So use that as a positive, not a negative. I'm going to have my organization audited every year and I'm going to prove to the world that we're compliant and sound so that when it comes to that decision-making that, that Jake was sharing before, where they have a choice because consumers and businesses have choices on you know, who they want to do business with. If I've got that SOC uh, assurance and somebody doesn't, I'm going all day long with the one that has that independent uh, SOC assurance. And, and, and you can kind of extrapolate that along the way with the other assessments, like whether it's PCI or others, the ones that are doing putting the extra time in and, and having those independent audits and, and security assessments performed, that's going to be the one that makes the difference. That's who I want to do business with. Exactly, yeah. Um, and, and so moving on to compliance as a differentiator, and all these bullets essentially kind of go back to the same thing about how to use cybersecurity to grow your business, expand your business, um, and get new opportunities. Um, if if, if uh, these days with, with more and more services, uh, platforms, it, a lot of it's going to the cloud, it's going to third-party service providers, um, less and less and less of, um, of these crucial and critical services are being done in-house. Um, if you already have been storing and protecting your data in-house for many, many years, and you're looking, you're on the hunt for a service provider, whether it's a, a cloud provider or, or whatever it is, um, you're looking for a new opportunity to move that data um, into the cloud, um, have it protected. You're going to be a, a, a good, a thorough organization should have a solid vendor, um, vendor management program, as well as uh, be performing due diligence um, prior to onboarding a new vendor or service provider, um, as well as on an ongoing basis. Um, and in the past, a lot of that due diligence was many times it was, you know, a checklist or a security questionnaire um, that's moving more and more to requesting actual compliance um, documentation, going back to what Jerry said with the SOC reports um, and, and the different types of certifications um, that you can get once you do hit that compliance uh, milestone. Yeah, and I'll tell you, that this fourth bullet, yeah, this is a great one, mitigating risks and reducing costs. So this, this says a lot of things. I think of examples with the, with the work that we do for different clients. When, you know, and, and while there is cost associated with having assessments performed and even implementing uh, controls by your own staff to, to fix those issues, to reduce the risk to reasonable levels. Once you do that, you know, that, that helps your environment be less risky, but also you can, you can move to reduce the scope. And that's really a starting point. Because if I can identify the risks and, and close those risks down by, by putting controls in place and mitigating the risks, I also can look at why do I have data? Sometimes folks are just doing it because it's always been there. And it's funny because we'll take a step back and say, guys, why do you even maintain that? Why do you need it there and there? Let's let's put all of our, for example, let's look at the, the logical world of, of, of say, a, a network diagram. Why do I have all these subnets that have confidential information? Why can't we move them into a common subnet or two that has separated, uh, has separated out from the back office uh, subnets and things like that? So now I reduce my footprint. I reduce that and my costs are being reduced. And, and therefore, once I prove that this is controlled properly and assessed to prove that it is 
sound and secure, now I've reduced my, my risk footprint and, and the opportunity for, for threats. It goes down dramatically. So it, it does have a financial, a big financial upside, not just the idea that I have a certification, I can show the world I'm clean, I've got a SOC two type two, I just, I, I, I've had an assertion from a third party provider like Compass Insurance Team or somebody that you're, you're comfortable with. But now I've reduced the risk and, and the threat is even smaller as you move forward. So that's a way of kind of maximizing uh, the investment of, of security in your environment. Yeah, and, and uh, great points, Jerry. And another way of, uh, or another way of thinking about reducing cost, cyber liability insurance, cyber insurance is, is huge these days. Um, I think we have some slides in, in the next couple of slides talking about the cost and, and you know, the payouts um, from those organizations. Um, but the premiums are getting higher and higher because those cyber insurance companies understand the risk and the liability that they are taking um, in protecting your business or any business out there. If you can prove your compliance, if you can prove your cybersecurity posture um, to the cyber liability insurance companies during you know, the onboarding phase of, of um, them taking you on as a client, you may potentially be able to get a, a lower premium and lower ongoing cost as well. Thanks, uh, Jake. Appreciate it. Enabling digital transformation. So the idea of, of, of like if you look at the old school of paper and hard copies and facilities, you know, where, where information is stored, you know, there's, there's a lot implied there with the, you know, in, whether it's record retention and ensuring that you're maintaining only those records that are needed. But there's a lot of benefit, obviously, in getting your you're transforming to a digital environment where you, you get rid of the old school paper and things like that. And it's an indexed and it, it's in a digital format now. And then removing and, and backing up and stuff becomes a lot easier to control and to manage. So, so that there's a lot of benefit to doing that. Can I pause you guys for one second to interject sure, yeah. the question? And I want to remind everybody you can pose these questions whenever, and I will interrupt these fellas and we can get these questions in very quickly. Uh, somebody asked, can you talk about, a bit more about the risk register and what should be in it and who should get it. Yeah, thanks. Great, great question. Thank you guys for, for uh, first of all, for this, for listening. I was glad I wasn't on mute the whole time. Uh, yeah, that that's um that's a great tool. And I'll tell you, a lot of our environments use it differently, but overall, the common use of it and, and the proper use of it is really, uh, as I touched on a little bit earlier, was you know whether I, I'm performing a self-assessment or I have an independent party performing, say, a SOC 2 type 2, like say a couple of insurance team came in, did a SOC 2 type 2 for an MSP, and there were a couple of control weaknesses in there. I would take those, I'd, I'd, I'd take the name of the audit, well, it's a SOC audit, and I'd say, you know, who did it, uh, who, you know, couple of uh, insurance team performed it, when was it done, okay, who owns these control weaknesses, okay, maybe it's Jake, he runs that department, so he owns fixing this one, it was listed as a high risk, and here's the mitigation strategy or plan to bring it to reasonable levels, and he went over with his team and says, I'll have that done by uh, the end of October, 2024. You know, things like that. So the, what should be in it are those elements. You can add more or less, but at the end of the day, knowing what the, when the audit took place, who performed the audit, who owns it, when it's going to be completed, the tasks uh, listed to complete that. And, and that way you can hold them accountable. And if you think about doing that for that audit, and then say I ran a pen test and all of a sudden I got a few things. So uh, issues came out, maybe I've got a level three or four, and I've got to take that risk and move to uh, mitigate the risk. Who owns it? Well, Jerry owns that one. He's going to have it done by the end of September. And, uh, you know, it's a medium risk, whatever. And then, you know, you, you list them all there. And as they are mitigated, they move off. I, I always recommend, hey, start with like a spreadsheet. You don't need to invest in this big tool. They don't want to sell you a million GRC tools. We're not in the business of that. We're in the business of, of protecting and securing our clients and their information. Uh, that they are they're entrusted with by their clients. So so especially now I get all my, my risks within this register, like I mentioned, as they are mitigated, I move them maybe to the next spreadsheet of that same workbook. So those are closed uh, control weakness, closed issues. And the new ones, new ones will come on as maybe your business grows and you've added some new delivery channels and now there's a new risk came in. Maybe you know you had a uh, a third party come in and risk assess you and they found a few things and those go on the list in the same way. And as they move out, they move to the next spreadsheet. That risk register, now what do I do with it, right? Well, I, uh, typically that's something that we, when we're working with banks and credit unions, they have an audit committee. They have a whole special dance that came from that world. And it is, it's very, it's very good because they're, they're held accountable through the audit committee. And, and, and basically you report that risk register to those folks. Here's where we're at now. Here's when these things will be done. Also, when federal examiners come in, they're gonna to wanna to see that. And they're gonna to wanna to see that you're bringing these things to proper closure, at least you're tracking them and stuff. And then the board of directors, you got to inform them as well. So, so that's kind of how it can and should be utilized to, to make sure that your risks are all in front of you at all times. You prioritize the highest risk to lowest. 
Can you move to mitigate those risks and you, and you can demonstrate the same? So moving on to our next slide, how to improve cybersecurity posture? Well, first, you know, you gotta get buy-in, right? We always, in the world I came from, it was always tone at the top. That was a big buzz term they used to use, tone at the top, meaning uh, whether it's executive, stake, stakeholders, could be board of directors, things like that, depending on who or what industry that you're in. So you gotta have their support, of course, you know, and, and uh, you know, along with IT and infrastructure, the whole C uh, suite really should should lead the charge. And IT, and uh, you know, implements what the direction is. So most organizations, really all, should have a, a, or perform an annual sort of a strategic planning, uh, perform a session uh, on what we're doing, you know, going forward. So, for example, we meet each quarter, each fourth quarter rather, to identify what we're going to do next year. We want to open up this new business or build building, or we want to deliver this new deliverable. And so you, you plan, you strategize, you plan, you put it to a project plan, assign ownership. IT owns pieces of it, like, oh, I'm going to in install the, the application that we, we talked about buying. Marketing says, oh, I'm going to I'm going to market the heck out of that thing. And, you know, and each group's, uh, you know, it, it has a piece of it to own it and the steps that each group needs to perform in order to roll out the, the directive from the top down from those, uh, you know, executives or stakeholders. That's the buy-in at the top that's setting the direction for the organization. So it's, it's adopted uh, enterprise-wide. And as you're building it now, thank God it, it, we're, we're more knowledgeable as an industry and as a world that we're, we're aware that we need to bake in cybersecurity. We don't, we used to retrofit in my day. I'm, uh, like I mentioned, I'm a lot older than Jake back then. It was like, here we go, we're gonna get to market. Oh gosh, there is risk out there. Now we're, we're trying to put in controls later, but at least now we're educated to a point where we know as we're building it, we're risk assessing, then we roll it out. Now we've got controls in place and we're doing it in a sound, secure manner. Yeah, great points, Jerry. And I just want to uh, reiterate on the buy-in. The buy-in is absolutely crucial. Um, if you don't have it coming from the top down, it's almost never going to go anywhere. Um, we go into clients all the time and you know you hear about it in news stories or from friends and family um, talking directly one-on-one -on -one with IT or security uh, people within the company. They know how important it is to be secure, how important it is to be compliant with the different regulations and frameworks. But if they can't get that to their management, to their leadership, and all the way up to the executives, it's never going to move anywhere. So that buy-in from the executive team or the C-suite um, is crucial. So we're looking to improve your cybersecurity posture, you know, so we're, it, it's, as we mentioned, it's not a, it's not a one and done. It's not a point in time. It's okay though. It's the, uh, neither is your business, right? If it was, you probably would be out of business. So you gotta, you've got to always pivot. You've always got to read the room and, and address, address the, the risks and threats that are constantly evolving. You also have to, uh, you know, uh, look at your competitors, right? How can I compete with these folks if I'm a smaller business? Technology is the answer. Technology can provide you tools to deliver uh, things you never could have done before with the size of your organization. Now you've got tools that the big players have and you can deliver and compete with them. But but I always say you got to do that at the same time with security in mind. So let's let's look to move to improve our, our, our security posture, getting the buy-in starts at the top, like we said before going through and, and as I roll out these new tools and, and I always say toys because I'm like IT geek, but as these things are getting rolled out, you, you want to assess them ongoing to make sure that hey, yesterday was sound and, and secure, but today we made some changes. And now all of a sudden I've opened up a new risk or there's a new opportunity there I need to address. And as those risks occur, well, let's get those over on a risk register and, and track those to closure. We'll sign clear ownership and we'll move through uh, that as we, as we go to uh, the rest of, uh, you know, the rollout. Yeah. So, so the next three bullets here, the ongoing assessments, the risk register and the remediation, they really go hand in hand. Um, in, in a perfect world, though, all three of those are going to end up in the risk register. Um, but a big aspect I want to point out is the ongoing assessments, whether it's a risk assessment or a technical, uh, you know, a, a vulnerability scan or penetration test. It should not be a one and done thing. You shouldn't do it once and forget about it for the next five, 10 years or even one year. Um, at, at the very minimum, um, a, um, a major risk assessment should be done annually. Um, many of our banking or credit union clients are performing uh, assessments on a, on a quarterly basis or even more frequently. Um, getting those documented into the risk register or getting those results documented, any findings, um, whether they're uh, you know, a positive finding or a negative finding, a gap, should all be documented um, with documented remediation steps. And like Jerry was mentioning before, who's the owner um, of that risk and of that remediation effort? When's it going to be accomplished? Um, and, then, and then documenting or kind of closing slash moving it off um, once it has been remediated. 
um, and confirmed. And like with any business, communications is big, right? So as we move to roll out new controls, we need to implement those controls. So it starts with documentation of those controls and policies to, you know, to make sure that now we're maybe we're doing a new, you know, uh, monitoring, we're using a new monitoring tool or, or employees are asked to do something new to adhere to. We need to make those policies um, um, visible to those clients, to those employees. They need to sign off annually that they acknowledge these policies exist and that they're held accountable. Management at the top, the buy-in, those those are the folks that sign off on these policies to make them viable. So communicating throughout as, as this occurs, as well as communicating the risk, as I mentioned earlier, with the risk register, as risks come into that register, communicate those to management as they're being brought on and brought out to closure. So management needs to be in a loop and all the way up and depending on your structure to the C to C level or even the board of directors on a regular basis so they can see, yeah, we had risk. That's great, we're monitoring. And, and now we're closing those and some new ones came on. That's okay. We're, as long as we get the same attention, we, we, we uh, sort those by the highest, the lowest risk. We put our resources on those highest ones and move to close those. And we keep communicating throughout. And uh, yep. like with anything. Yeah. Yeah. And then communications ties into to the last bullet here, continuous education. Uh, a lot of us refer to it as security awareness training, security training. Um, we all know what it entails, or we should, um, at least by this point. Um, having that continuous education of all your staff, it doesn't matter uh, from the lowest level all the way up to the C-suite and everywhere in between um, should, be, uh, should be receiving and it should be mandatory um, regular security awareness training or education. Um, and not just how to craft a good password or how to you know, notice a phishing email, but about the trends that are out there in the industry. What could affect your business specifically? Um, and then you can go even, in, even into more detail with role-based training. Um, you know, somebody on the, on the C-suite team should probably get a little bit more of an in-depth training um, than, you know, maybe somebody working on the floor or in a warehouse or in a sales role. Um, tailoring it to that specific role um, is more and more crucial as time goes on um, and responsibilities change. Yeah, this is another example, too, when we talked about the difference between compliance and, and security, because, you know, in all these regs and frameworks and, and, and such, you know, sure, it's, it's listed that you need to have security awareness training, but... Uh, at the end of the day, you know, that, that will make you compliant, check the box. But if you look at that, what's applied there is you think of your employees, the, the employees can be your weakest point or your strongest point. Because you can have a fortress. I can have the best firewall and monitoring and all that. But at the end of the day, if I, if I don't educate my staff and they're clicking on links and introducing threats within, within the, uh, the uh, network that was, you know, maybe the perimeter solid, but within the network, I'm bringing them right at the front door. You know, I don't care what you have for a firewall, I'm already inside, you know, so, so educate your staff, make them the strongest point, not the weakest point. Yep. I have a question for you guys before you get to that next slide. I want to remind everybody too. feel free to throw some more questions out there. I did get another one. Uh, this one's uh, for you, Jerry. Could you recommend the best service for email security? Organization has been experiencing a significant increase in spam emails and phishing attempts. So I'd start with this. I'd start with policies, like we said, right? So let's introduce a strong policy at an organization, have folks, uh, you know, uh, once it's signed off on now, it's officially a policy. Let's ensure our staff has, uh, has availability to access this policy and they understand what it means and they sign off. Next thing is ensuring that we educate, like we just said in the last, I educate my staff on, hey, as emails come in, don't click on this. Three things. People go, oh, let's hover over this. Uh, I got 300 emails a day easily. And that's on a slow day. I, if I'm sitting there hovering and stuff, you, you know, I'll, be, I'll be done with my email tonight. And then I'll, I'll start the work day. How about this? What if we just did three things, right? What if when emails came in, number one, if it has an attachment, I do not download. I do not open that attachment until I reach out to the source. So I reach out through an email separately or a text or a phone call quickly. Hey, even if it's my business partner, Bill De Palma, I'd, I'd say, hey, Bill, did you send this to me? So don't do that. Just call or text. It takes two seconds. Number two, links. It has a link in there. Click on this link. We'll take you to this. Hey, I'm not clicking on anything. Guess what I'm doing? I'm picking up the phone. I'm sending a text. We have all the tools in our hands. In fact, it's like my family. They never put them down. They got the, they got the phone in their hands all the time. Well, how about sending a text while you're at it? You know, hey, did you send this? You did. Good. I can open it. I, click on, I can click on that link. And the third threat that you get in an email, sometimes it'll tell you, hey, go ahead and uh, you know, uh, do this. Uh, I changed my address. Change this address, uh, billing address to a different location. Uh, you know, so it's not going to go here, send the bills here. Now that sounds benign. It sounds like, oh, who cares? It's a bill. Go ahead and pay it. That's not what happens. And, and I'll give you a, a real life example of that with uh, actually the healthcare industry where 
uh, bills were either misprinted prop they weren't printed properly so they threw them away and reprinted them somebody went in and did a little dumpster dive and they grabbed those and people say well so good pay my pay my health care bill that's not what they did what they did do in actuality was they they actually called each one of these patients or you know consumers but their patients and called them and say hey, look uh, you have a bill you had a procedure performed on this date you know you owe x amount and sure it's going to make sense you're going to get credibility immediately they can tell you a little bit about what happened. And now they'll say, well, I have, you know, if you have a credit card handy, we can take that payment over the phone. And even if only 10% of the people are fooled by this, and it's very convincing. Uh, and by the way, it was more than 10% that were fooled in this example. And, and that's how even a bill can become a, a weapon or a, a, a threat. Furthermore, there are other tools like Mimecast for email. So there's, there's built-in stuff within Microsoft 365. 360, I would say 365, but 360, and you can get, you can uh, you can filter, you can do a lot of things with Microsoft right out of the box. And if you have, you need help, reach out to us after this conference. We'll give you some more details on that. But there are also tools, independent tools like Mimecast and other tools that will filter. So we used to educate, and I, again, I came from the banking world. We'd educate folks on, hey, do not put the don't put the account number in the email, or don't do this, don't do that. And and these knuckleheads would do it. They were trained well, but they would still just people being people. And uh, and with these tools I'm mentioning. You actually can filter that out. It will quarantine or strip it off and stop employees or people from being people. It will stop that and you'll be notified so that they can go back and educate that employee not to do that anymore and, and to rather to adhere to our policies. So hopefully that answers it. Yeah, great points, Jerry. It was a good answer. And I had another question come in while you were giving that answer. Uh, the question is, we are going through the process of strengthening a number of our internal controls and would love to leverage these efforts to lead to more business, but aren't sure the best way to get this info out to the masses. How are your clients spreading the word effectively? So couple, there's a couple of things implied there. First thing I'd say is I'd step back and say, do I always ask this, do I need, because all the controls and all the money that you spend resources in terms of putting controls and building up a sound, secure environment, those are about the, the information that you're you're maintaining or so either storing, transmitting, or processing. So if you can shrink that footprint for starters, like ask yourself, do I why do I have it there? Do I always need it there? Do I need this? Do I need to maintain it for that long? How long legally do I need to? So so first shrink the environment as much as you can and ensure the controls you know are in place uh, with that. And then on the other part, what was the other part of the question, um, Nick? Uh, the other part, the, the ending of the question was, how are your clients spreading the word effectively, spreading the right. word? So what they're doing is, yeah, thank, thanks, Nick. And thanks who, who asked that question. Be, you know, what they're doing is also is like in the example of if I'm a managed service provider, I'm, I'm putting stuff like that on my website. I'm not bragging that nobody can break in, but I am putting my attestations out there relative to being PCI compliant or I hate I'm a service provider and I just had a SOC 2 tag 2 and I make it available through a, a client portal so customers of ours can get in and see the uh, assertion from the, the AICPA firm, uh, you know, whether it's Compass Assurance Team or another firm, but but make that available to them. So you're almost, you don't want to brag, there's a fine line there, but you do want to indicate that you've got the pro appropriate secure um, uh, independent audits to prove your security and assessments and attestations. Yeah, great points. Um, like Jerry said, on the website, that's a huge one. You A lot of times you'll see it on the About Us page or on a, even a compliance, you know, menu drop down at the top of the website. Um, we often see it in brochures. Um, you know, brochures aren't really mailed out as much as they used to be, but even magazines, different business magazines and publications, um, companies will put their different certifications and compliance records in those types of publications. Um, and then at conferences and different meetings uh, um, within the industry, it's another good way to, um, to demonstrate that, that you are compliant and you have these, uh, the robust cybersecurity posture as well. Thanks, Jay. So going forward here with this one here, we're looking at the next couple of slides, we're going to look at some of the some of the stuff you're up against, right? So statistics on cyber attacks, like if you look at, and you probably were reading this while we're speaking, some of this is kind of scary, right? It's changing every day, but I read something recently too about um, ransomware, how it's ramped up so badly and the most uh, cost so far was, was set in 2024 to date, which is insane. So as you thought like, oh, that's an old, uh, that's an old threat, isn't it? No, it's still around. So is, you know, different things like denial of service attacks. You're like, really? That still exists? You know, what, SQL injection? That's been around since I before my hair was gray. So that was a while ago. <laughs> but anyway, these things are still out there and they're evolving for sure as businesses and, 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 and the security stack and things changes for, for organizations there. The at, bad actors are always modifying their attacks as well. So if you look at it, you know, uh, the, it's predicted to reach 9.5 trillion US dollars in 2024 and reaching 10.5 trillion by 2025. That is you know, the, the cost of, of, of cybercrime, it's insane. 
And, uh, you know, records breach, you can read it like I can. 7.6 mil for AT&T, move it with 77 mil, Ticketmaster, 560, BOA, 57,000. And then our great security, Social Security Administration, <laughs> you know, some of those, boy, these, these scare you. But it just, you know, look, you're not going, it's not a matter of if you're going to be under attack at some point. It's a matter of when. So be prepared, have good policies and procedures in place. And, and then an incident response plan and business continuity plan that's up to date, that's been tested. We do a heck of a lot of that and we do it for good reason because when these things, these aren't just numbers we made up, which, which they were. So you look at the annual cost on this slide uh, across the board on these things and they're, they're, they're scary. I know we only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna to move to wrap a little bit and get to our, our summary, but uh, you know, um, how to sell your cybersecurity posture. Yeah, so, so going back to kind of everything we've talked about since the beginning of this presentation um, about changing the thinking, and it goes back to, to the buy-in on the second bullet here. Um, uh, for the longest time, security was an afterthought, like Jerry mentioned, and it's always been thought of, IT and, and information security has been thought of as a cost center. Um, and obviously it does cost your business money. You need the people, the tools, the systems, the resources. It is going to cost you some money, but the, but the benefits of the, um, of the effort put into that and the resources um, that are put into the cybersecurity posture um, will pay off in the long run. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And then so kind of summarizing to allow for any more questions here. In summary, basically cybersecurity protects against criminal threats while compliance ensures adherence to the laws and regs. I still like the fence uh, analogy that yeah. Jake gave easier to remember for sure, but maintain a strong posture, strong security posture. And it starts with, again, we talked about having the policies and, and monitoring and staying up to date on these evolving threats, educating your staff ongoing, right? And making sure that you've got the appropriate controls in place and you're monitoring those controls because they're changing. Your business is changing and so are, th are the threats. So just stay educated and educate your staff ongoing. Reach out to Compass, companies like Compass for, for assistance. And if you've got your go-to, go to them and say, hey, look, folks, this is what we're looking to do. I just need to make sure that, you know, I want to be here tomorrow. I don't want to be in, in, in the news tomorrow because I had inappropriate controls or I didn't monitor. I want to save a nickel. That's not where you want to save your money. So I hope that was helpful. Jake, um, uh, Nick, were there any further questions for Jake and I? I have one question remaining, and I will give everybody one final chance here. If you want to drop some questions in, we can get those posed now. The last question is, we take security very seriously, and our efforts and budget reflects that. But we have run into many situations where a prospective client prioritizes a low-cost solution over robust security controls from their vendor. Anything you recommend to overcome this obstacle and change their mindset? So if, it's, if I'm reading it right, I'm hearing it right, it sounds like you're saying your client is imposing this on you. Like, oh, hey, listen, I'm not going to spend a lot of money on this big solution. They, they have, they're imposing sort of a, a weaker one. Um, my, I, if that's the case, I mean- the way, Yeah, the way I read the question is they're looking to land a, a prospective client. Uh, and this client is prioritizing a low cost solution over their solution, which is uh, implied to be more secure. Yeah, you know, the old adage, you get what you pay for, is in play here. I would, uh, there's certain things I would take, um, I would cut corners on, and security and safety are not among those. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, just demonstrate, and that's a weakness on the other side. And that might even be a trick question by the potential vendor, but at the end of the day, demonstrating your security, your compliance, and that independent sort of SOC 2 type 2 audit, or if it's a PCI type client, you had a report on compliance audit, a ROC performed by a qualified security assessor. Demonstrating your security is going to serve you today, whether you win that client or not. Trust me, it will serve you today. You'll be around tomorrow to compete with the other ones. But I, I believe that would be, and I would, I would educate them potentially on that uh, on that point. Like, you know what, that's a good point. But here, here at XYZ Company, we take security uh, you know, seriously. It starts at the top. Our, our board of directors, our C-level folks, and all the way down to the lowest people. So if you do business with my company, you can rest assured that the client's that entrust their information with you, they're going to they're going to be just as safe with us.